everyone, Jane Applegath here, founder of the Epic Vision Zone, where we say life is too short to be quiet. Each show, we offer you an inspiring person or message to bring you closer to living your epic life now. Thank you for being here. You can listen to the audio version on your favorite app or watch it on YouTube and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. John Adar wrote, communication is the sister of leadership, something today's guest knows all about. Roberta Nadella hails from the Zulu tribe in South Africa, whose foundation is Ubuntu, which means humanity. I am because you are. Roberta spent 15 years in corporate South Africa, where she realized that technical skills can only take you so far. It was during this time that she noticed several colleagues were overlooked for promotions despite their noticeable technical skills. Having worked in project teams that included engineers, transportation planners, environmental consultants, and urban planners, she quickly realized no one can effectively lead such a varied team without collaboration and visionary skills. Roberta then spent a decade teaching English in South Korea. This experience opened her eyes to navigating more cultural diversity in the workplace. When she settled in the US in 2020, Roberta followed her passion and launched the Speaking and Communication podcast. The podcast highlights the necessary soft skills that professionals and entrepreneurs need to highlight their brilliance and get credit for it. Welcome, Roberta. So nice to have you here today. Thank you, Jane. What a one amazing introduction. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you and I am excited to get started because this is one of the top skills that everyone needs in business today. So let's start at the beginning. What inspired you to do the work that you do today? I know we covered a little bit of it in the story, but give us some idea of how that transition came to take place. So the backstory essentially is this is now going to give away my age. My country had the history of apartheid. We call it the colorful history of apartheid, which ended in 1994. So 1995 was my first corporate job, a year after democracy. And you had companies that went very diverse prior to that, admitting us as part of the professional staff. And that is major adaptation issues to begin with. And secondly, as you mentioned in the intro, in the engineering sector, you have professionals who have embraced this. I'm an introvert. I just do my work on my desk and my cubicle. Don't bother me types. And they fully just embrace that personality and they go with it. However, one of the things we did when we worked in these varied project teams you mentioned was mostly government because we had a new government in place now and they needed guidance on how to unify the country improve the infrastructure and that's mostly the work that we did when you have politicians maybe american ones don't need much patience but my country's politicians do <laughs> when you have politicians as your client there's a lot of relationship building skills you need to have a lot of patience you need to have as i said and you bid for jobs at first. But what I came to notice, because I was with my first company for five years, is that there comes a time when they say, we want to work with Jane. They don't send the job out for bidding because Jane is good with working with them, the relationship. You don't just come to their government offices and say, here you are, here you go, here's your engineering plan, goodbye. You know how to build the relationship. So those things I started to notice, as you said, even those who got promoted within the company, it wasn't always the smartest engineering guy who produced the best CAD drawings. It's the ones who know how to speak to people because engineering teams are so diverse. So those are mm. the things I started to notice. And I noticed them because people don't tell you this in school or university. You're right, they don't. And this is something that it, it's, it, you know, Roberta, it's actually very, very um, useful in every industry. I was listening to you and I was like, you have so much awareness to notice that. I mean, I'm sure the engineers probably were so 
um, involved with their work that maybe a lot of them didn't even notice the reason that they weren't getting some particular projects. And those that were, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were building the rapport, they were building the relationships. And I was previously in the financial industry. So I, my entire business was based on relationships and they are very, very paramount to being successful in any business that you do. Um, and even in your personal life as well. So absolutely, I love that story. And I have to give it to you for noticing it because a lot of people just go through life and they just go, well, they didn't get the job. But you were you were actually noticing the reason was because there was a lack of, of rapport, there was a lack of communication. So that's, thank you so much for that insight. So I can tell already you're very yeah. brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jane. It's my pleasure. And just to add one more thing as well, the one benefit of that, as I said, my country was changing. So all these companies that needed diverse talent, when you go to a project team, remember they're joint venture companies, meaning there are other companies that sit in there. They are watching. They're noticing who's speaking up, who's having an idea. And when you are a required brilliant engineer, First of all, your boss is going to take credit for your work, even though you did it. If he's doing all the speaking and you're quiet, nobody remembers you. But if you speak up, guess what? A week later, they will come and say, Roberta, can we offer you three times your package? We'd really have love to have you on our team. It gives you opportunities. <laughs> I <laughs> opportunities. love that. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Open the door to opportunities. That's why I love what we say here. Life is too short to be quiet. You know, that's our tagline. Right. So speak up, speak up. Oh my gosh. I, thank you for adding that. So what eye opening experience did you have when you first entered corporate? So other than the stuff that I've mentioned, the first thing I noticed was speaking of the relationships, yes, those are very important. However, you have to be really good at what you do. And I don't mean perfect. When we say excellence, we don't mean perfect. Be very, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's. When you do a summary report for a client, make sure that you've done spell check. I mean, back then we didn't have Google yet, but you know, let your colleague check your work because sometimes you, it's your work so you won't be able to notice the mistakes. So make sure that everything has been checked, everything that needs to be included has been included. You've checked the numbers. You've been in finance. You know what it's like when the numbers don't add up. And so make sure that even the work you present is a great representation of you, your division, which is your team, and your company. It's very, very important because all the skills we mentioned earlier at the beginning of the interview, they're very important. But in addition to that, at the end of the day, you still need to be a subject matter expert in what you do, present it in a way that shows that I'm qualified to be here. Right. Yes. You are. Mm. It's basically, like you said, it's a representation of your work. And that is something that, you know, you usually get one chance for that. And if it, like you said, it's, it's, there's so many errors or mistakes, then they wonder, well, is this what it's always going to be like? But yes, I love that. The work is a representation of not only your work, but your values, because if you don't value, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, uh, the type of work that you're putting forward, what does that say about you? You know, there's exactly. a lot of, it's yeah, a representation. A, mm. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Well, career shift. Now, what caused you to make the leap from corporate South Africa to English teaching in South Korea? <laughs> That's actually a very funny story. Just a bit of background on that. You know how, when we grow up as kids, they ask you, Jane, what do you want to be when you grow up? The first thing I said, before I started first grade, I said I wanted to be a teacher. 
And they said, no way, you are too smart. Teachers are the least paid you're going to put poor. Never, ever, ever, Roberta, say in your life that you want to be a teacher. Close that door. <laughs> I went to corporate, studied business as I was advised. And later, after being in corporate for 15 years, as you've mentioned, I had a friend at the time I was working for a consultant, con management consulting firm in Cape Town, beautiful city in my country, was not happy in my job. So the, that contrast alone, not, not, a, not a, an ideal situation indeed. So a friend of mine who is South Korean by birth and heritage, but was born in South Africa suggested this to me. So I just went and Googled. At the time I wasn't, even, she just said, it's, you're gonna travel. I heard that South Africans teach in my home country too. So I just Googled, I said, this sounds fascinating. And I've always wanted to be a teacher anyway. I remember my aunt who she's now a principal, but when she was a teacher and I was in grade school, she would say to me, please help. And I would volunteer, I said, please help me grade the kids. She was teaching grade three. Please help me grade the kids books. And then she will check them afterwards because I'm a kid. She needs to make sure I've done everything perfectly. And she'll say to my mom, oh, I can't believe she did it perfectly. And she's so young. So teaching has always been my thing. So I just felt like South Korea was a, a full circle moment for me. And the thing about teaching English, I got to learn also the distinction between English for conversation and business English. Those are mm. two different facets of right. English. So that that's how that started. But the reason I spent so much time there, I spent over a decade is I've just always loved teaching. <laughs> I knew as a kid that this is who I am. <laughs> so that's yes. how that happened. I, I can I can hear and feel that you found it extremely rewarding, you know, and that's that's um that's wonderful because it 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 was it's something that resonates with who you are meant to be. And and often we go on other paths. I've been on several myself, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, from, from, uh, court, from finance to uh, television production to yoga instructor to podcaster. So, yes. And I, if you asked me when I was young, what do you want to do when you grow up? I never, well, first of all, there wasn't any such thing as a podcaster. <laughs> so yeah. that was, that would have been, you know, out there. But yes, you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of us need, we, we, we can work to find our paths. And the beauty is that you took the leap. You took the leap to say, I, something here does not feel right. And I'm going to try and see what it's like to delve into something that's always been in my heart. And I feel that's going to come, that's coming full circle with what you do today. So Mm -hmm. Kudos to you for for listening to your heart, because a lot of people don't, and that that takes courage, absolutely. So, what was it like adjusting then to a new culture and language? Because that is a big change, and people are not normally very good at change, especially something that big. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the story chain, but I'll just quote one. The first one is a very funny culture shock within one month of arriving there situation. You know how we live in countries where they, where they say, you're a lady, don't pick up heavy stuff. Grant will pick it up. You don't pick up a big vase with flowers. And we were on the second floor of the public school we were teaching in. That's where the English center was. And they had bought us these huge clay vase flowers with sand, so they're heavy already and then the sand and the flowers and there were three of them and there's three of us English teachers so each one of us had to go downstairs and pick one when I tried to pick it up and I felt how heavy it was I said to my co-teacher shouldn't they ask the members to help us with this because I don't think we should be picking this up and the first thing she said to me was we've been instructed to pick these up we need to take them upstairs and that was it that's when it dawned on me, I'm not in South Africa, I'm in a new world. And if I'm going to be happy here and do my job well, I need to adapt. Because here's the thing, you hear stories of English teachers in South Korea and in other countries too, but I'll talk about South Korea, 
where they do what is called a midnight run. Midnight run means Roberta came there, she realized that, oh, this culture is just too different from where she comes from. She doesn't even tell her school that she's leaving. She doesn't finish the 12 month contract, obviously. And she just books a flight back to America, she's gone. She just mm -hmm. could not handle the, it's, it's just mm -hmm. too uncomfortable and too different. But if you say to yourself, I know my reasons for being here, I will be able to, I want to learn to adapt to how they do things here. I mean, and at the end of the day, it's just where the school is, where the work is. When I go home, I'll do what I want in my apartment. It doesn't mean I'm going to pick up heavy flowers. <laughs> it's just at work. And it doesn't mean every day we pick up heavy flowers. So sometimes mm -hmm. some situations make people think, oh, this is too hard. But it doesn't mean you do this every day or all the time. So it's up to you to whatever your mindset is will determine whether you've had people who went to Korea thinking, I'll be there for one year. I stayed for 10 years. Some have, are still there for over 30 years because mm -hmm. they love it that much. It doesn't mean that everything is kosher, but just those moments do not make them think, oh, I don't want to be here. It's too different from where I come from. No, 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 no. And then when it comes to language, yes, our jobs did not require us to be, to, to speak Korean because they wanted to make the kids do immersion English. Mm -hmm. So even if you know the Korean word, they don't want you translating it. Yes, to make it easy. They want you to describe, use pictures so that they become English immersed. So it's good for you to learn for your own personal benefit to learn some phrases Always, when you come to a place, you learn, hello, please, thank you. The, within the first hour of me being there, hello, please, thank you. I need to, to learn those three in Korean. And then everything else, what you learn, yes, you got Google Translate, but it's good to just know, you know, how you respect, because respect is a big thing, just like in my culture. Mm -hmm. Respect is a big thing. You respect them even if they don't conduct themselves the way things are done in your country. You respect the way they do it in their country because I think sometimes that's what we struggle with. And when you can do that and have that mindset, no matter where you are work-wise, you'll be able to adapt. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's having that, that uh, ability we call it in VUCA, which we'll discuss a little later, it's the anti-fragile resilience. So it's not just being resilient, but it's shifting so that it, it serves you. So that, that you know, when you, when you make a change, it's, it's not arduous, but it's something that will elevate you to the next level. And in your case, it elevated you to accommodating their culture as opposed to fighting against it because you're right, the human nature does not like change. And not only were you in a new country, a new culture, a new language, a new job, that is a lot to handle all at once. So absolutely, I love your philosophy. And yes, you are absolutely correct. It's all about mindset. Um, and that is a key to, to life, really, basically. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you for that story. What was the motivation now to launch at the speaking and communicating podcast? Yes. So when I incorporated those two, the 15 year corporate experience in my home country, plus the decade of uh, a decade of teaching English in South Korea, I arrived at the beginning of the pandemic, actually not knowing, I don't think any of us had the foresight that it was going to be a global pandemic. We just thought it was going to be contained over there. Because in the span of a decade when I was there, we went through MERS, we had SARS. I just thought it will be contained there. They'll fight it and it's going to be gone. But fast forward, so I came here and then I stayed about a year and a half later of arriving in the U.S. I thought, okay, I have these skills and I remember not only the stuff we have mentioned, but also just knowing how to make a presentation. Mm. Because when I was in South Korea, one of the things I did, there's a lot of 
uh, foreigners will say, okay, what am I going to do for extracurricular uh, activities? Language exchange, drinking buddies, partying, play pool, whatever it is. I decided to join Toastmasters and I made a lot of friends there. But one thing I noticed was our Korean counterparts use Toastmasters to also improve their presentation skills when asked to present in English in the, at their jobs. So it's, it, it, it serves so many purposes for them, not just to speak. You know, oh, you have a speech, let's evaluate you, Toastmasters um, qualities. But they actually use that as, and it did enhance their job skills. They got promoted because of the practice of using Toastmasters as a platform to practice, to say, if I'm presenting in Korean, I present a certain way, I'm used to that. But now I have to present in this language, in business English. How do I do that? And if my audience is English speaking, how is that different from me just presenting to my Korean colleagues? And so that's how they use that. And it also helped us to understand from their perspective how these because language, we always think, oh, it just means you translate. Oh, Jane, okay, if you speak Korean, just take English and translate it. it it's not as simple as that. So mm -hmm. when I started the podcast, those are all the things I wanted to address. And at first, I just thought it would be about speaking, but I realized that it then feeds into leadership, as you mentioned earlier, that the skills then help you become a better leader. That's how you got promoted and then start to be in leadership positions because you are able to demonstrate that you have those skills. So that's what the podcast is mainly about. Mm, absolutely. And I can see that. I was, when you were mentioning that, you can actually not even be, say, the expert in a particular subject. You know a lot, but you're not at the top. But if you have good communication skills, you will be the one that flows to the top because you have the ability to lead, I could say lead yourself and lead your thoughts. And that is an art. It's an art. I mean, that's why we have, uh, you know, you actually have debate contests. Um, and, and I think that's in, in some of the schools, the private schools, they actually have, you know, they have debate classes. And that's a wonderful way to hone your skills. And like you said, take them to the next level, which in, in your case, in the Toastmasters in Korea, it was they took it to the presentation of a business project. Um, so yes, I could see that. Uh, and communication skills today are everything. And I'm telling you, Roberta, you have got a field that is wide open because mm -hmm. the younger generation has lost the art of communicating because of technology. I try right. not to judge because I know that they make me <laughs> sound like I'm judgy with that, which is so funny. And speaking of that, the other day I gave an example to my guest about communication in business. I said, when I started my job, my mentor used to, because you, you would print out the letter and then in paper, then hit it and said, by the time it's the 10th edit, only then is he happy enough to sign it. And then it goes to the client as a cover letter for whatever we're sending. I used to think, when is this man going to get done with this letter? He keeps rephrasing and rephrasing and making it better. And remember, my country's been colonized by the British. So our English is very formal. Just when you think a phrase is formal, it gets more formal. Just when you think it couldn't be more formal, it sounds like Buckingham palace more and more formal business for business and so i come from that background and now you have texting language first of all before i get to what it is now i remember not only bef before even before i went to south korea they used to say to me when i write an email how do you sound so professional <laughs> when did you learn that and then I got to Korea. That's the compliment I used to receive. Your 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 letters. How do you write that? That sounds you. They one of them, my friend, who was my co-teacher. She used to say to me, "Roberta, teacher, you sound like you talk like the Queen." I said, "Yeah, we, we were colonized by the British, so that makes sense." But 
now you have texting language the abbreviations the short form the i had to stop writing d and say hi oh hello jane because it, they said no nobody says that you must say hi jane this is the email and this is what i'm like oh i had to be told to stop that in this day and age because now and, and a lot of organizations are trying to merge these two worlds because you have, I'm 48, so you have managers, leaders, CEOs from my era having team members in their 20s who just graduated college coming with the new texting communication language. And somehow they have to work together. So I don't know how they're going to bridge that gap, but we, earlier you and I said, we cannot do things like we used to. So I don't know if the older generation, are they, are they being encouraged to let go of the formal language and just fully embrace texting? I don't know what the happy medium is, but somehow those two worlds in any organization are starting to come together and there's going to, be a way to find to find a way for them to I, I don't know what you think Jane but this is where we are right now well when we figure out the secret we'll publish it <laughs> and make millions <laughs> <laughs> I look forward yes, to it yeah because you're absolutely right it's and I have to tell you it is an art it is an art I keep saying that because you need to use your communication skills, not only in the speaking realm, but you need to use them in, like you said, the written skills. And the written skills are, are going way by the wayside. I've always been very good at um, writing and writing very, uh, very good letters uh, to edify individuals. And that is an art. It really is. Mm -hmm. And I think if if we start to look at it in that way, we change the perspective of communication. It is an art. And then people might start to gravitate more towards, okay, that sounds interesting. But absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And uh, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Um, and because they don't speak, the young generation, you know, they do it all by text. So it, it's... Right. Yeah, and even their texts are not good English. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm I I was born in Canada, so I have a lot of the British in me as well. You know, because it was it was mm. uh, a call. Yeah. The, the formality of the language. And the first time I received W Y D, I had to go and Google. I'm I'm not ashamed to say that. I had to go and Google and say, what is W Y D? What does that mean? Oh, I don't know. Because <laughs> this of person those. is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know. yeah this is what happened and earlier i just sorry jane to interrupt you Ella, there's a, a story i wanted to share quickly when you said the the leadership skills are what get you to the top i had a guest who had been in the military for 20 years mm -hmm. and when she left marines i think when she left she was offered a leadership position in an organization that is in tech and she told them, she said, I, I know nothing about tech. I was in the military for 20 years, so this is not for me. They said, no, no, you don't understand. We need you for your leadership skills. Because not only that, her way, like we're talking about being formal, the way she presents herself, the way she addresses others at a meeting in the boardroom, the way she addresses her team. You know, in the, in the military, there's just so much formality, so much protocol. And they wanted in this tech sector where everybody just, you know, comes in jeans, does whatever they want, and they program and freelance, whatever it is, they, they needed that. And she was really good. She still has the job. She's really good at leading the team, despite not knowing anything about programming. Right. Yes, absolutely. Mm. It's totally, yeah, I could see where that could happen. Absolutely. Wow, that uh, it really is amazing. And what, which brings us to my next topic, list today's top communication skills for both personal and professional growth and success. 
for personal for professional growth the top skills one would be emotional intelligence yeah. we always say that we are all children in big bodies and we all get triggered if you i hope you stay away a little bit away from social media but i know we have to post for podcasts and everything but I hope you stay away from comments where people are fighting and everything is just, there's just a lot of conflict and pushback and friction. And when you get to know yourself that well, and you know your triggers, if you lead a team especially, or if you are part of a team, and one of your colleagues does something that you don't like or they are late for a part of the report that it should feed into whatever it is you're doing you don't just pick up the phone jane where is it i'm waiting for it now and and hang up the phone there's just so much when you deal with us humans humans we are a bit complex yes but learn to be able to control to have some form of control and articulate, mm -hmm. we, we call it, I'm expressing myself, Jane, I'm honest, I'm expressing myself. People have used that to not be able to emotionally, intelligently articulate what it is that they need to the next person and they just throw a gasket. And that's not the right. work environment we want to create, yes. And then secondly, we back to conflict resolution, right. whether, some of them are conflict avoided so if you do something i don't like i will never stay I, I will walk past your office class and never say hello again in the morning towards the coffee machine whatever it is you, you need to be able to talk things over which is another skill related to the first one as well because at the end of the day we are dealing with humans humans richard Branson says humans are the first customer and when you treat them well they will treat your customers well the outside customers. Mm -hmm. So anything related to how you relate to people, I think is the most important skill. I've had companies that say, we can teach them the technical, but the way that, yeah, but the way that this person walked in here with that attitude, oh, I'm not sure if they're going to be a great fit for the company. I recently interviewed Dr. Schneider who wrote a book about leadership. He did his PhD and wrote the book about it. He says this one guy who was a direct, applying at the hospital for a director position that he interviewed, he, he knew everything. He just thought, what a brilliant candidate. This guy's gonna be a great fit for a, a hospital when he left. At least he thought it's a given, he's got the job. And then he went to each and every one of his staff who the guy walked past from entering the elevator to the reception desk, to being directed to his office, how he interacted with them. Apparently he mm. complained about the hotel, he wasn't happy with this and he wasn't happy. He was just snappy with everybody. But when he get to the CEO, Dr. Schneider's office, he acted out perfectly. Mm -hmm. So had he not asked his team how this guy was when he walked in here, he would have not only given him the job, but these people would have had to report to him. How would that have mm -hmm. improved, changed the morale of the hospital? So that is the professional, uh, that, that's why professional right. skills, it, professionally, these skills are very important. And then personally, I always quote this um, statistic of, I used to think when they say the divorce rate is 50%, I wonder what's the number one reason. Ah, it has to be money. I mean, you've been in banking, Jane. <laughs> it has to be money. But it's actually lack of communication. Communication, yeah. Yeah. Mm, it's communication. Whether it's married couples, whether it's parent and children, especially with teenage kids. Teenagers always feel, ah, nobody understands me. My parents don't understand me. They feel unheard. Communicate. Everything falls down to communication. I know we sound like broken records, but everything falls down to communication. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's the human nature. It goes back to the prehistoric days. It's about telling stories and understanding one another. And you you can only do that through communication, whatever that might be. You know, I mean, uh, however you communicate. But you're absolutely right. Um, and and those, of course, once you have that gift 
or you learn that art, you you can excel in any industry, I believe. And you can, um, you know, I always say to women, uh, speak up, because that's one of the things that we are very bad at doing. We don't, we don't speak, not just speak our mind, but speak up because we don't have the confidence. And that's an art as well. You know, you need to, it's like you said, practice. It's a practice, it's a practice, it's a practice. And I say life is a practice. And like you said, there's certain things that you cannot teach. You can always teach someone the technical aspects. You can always teach somebody how things work, but you cannot teach emotional intelligence or what, okay, so here's an example, which I was shocked when my yoga teacher offered me her class to teach it. And she was a big yoga instructor, very loved by the community. And I said, oh my gosh, I said, I don't know if I can do it. I said, really? I said, that's such an honor. And I said, why, why, why we had other, you know, trained uh, individuals who were taking the course. And she said, well, Jane, here's the thing. I can teach you all the technical skills, which I know, you know, but I can't teach you heart and you have heart. And I was like, whoa, I'd never forgotten that. And I was like, wow. and then when you told, when you said to me a minute ago that, you know, I can teach you the technical skills, but I can't teach you the communication. That's part of all of what we're talking about because the communication does come from the heart, at least authentic communication, right? Mm. So, Thank you for that. That that really it just resonated with me. So, thank you for that information. If any of our listeners think that they do not have time to invest in these very incredible skills, what would you say to them? <laughs> I always say what is it costing you right now? Mm -hmm. Remember when Dr. Phil, what has it been now? Three years since he became famous and he used to tilt his bald head and go, how's that working for you? Um, we always say, if you don't work on these right now, what is it costing you relationship wise? What is it costing you job wise? What is it costing you in terms of, because you're the one who ends up being personally frustrated when things don't go your way and you wonder why you were overlooked and you wonder why you were not given, you know, in how in some companies they'll say, oh, I got this big account, this multi-million dollar account. When they give it to one of your colleagues instead of you, because you never know, everybody's always observing, especially leaders, you never know the intricacies, the things that they've been observing about you how you handle situations that don't go your way, how you handle crisis, how you handle when you make a presentation and you make a mistake, do you carry on or do you just get so stressed and think, oh my goodness, this whole thing is falling apart, somebody help me. How do you handle situations when things don't go according to plan? All of those things are things, as you said, Jane, these are skills that you learn and you first need to be aware of who you right. are, as you said earlier, get to know yourself. And then you start to notice, wait a minute, huh, when this happens, this is how I respond. But if I observe my leader, when this happens, he just goes with the flow when he carries on as if, you know, and he brings everybody in and we all laugh together. And then he continues with the presentation, whatever it is, always observe yourself. But more than anything, if you feel Always ask yourself what it's costing you. The other day I right. spoke to someone and said, I just need to learn presentation skills because I want to I want to be seen as better at my job. So I already know I'm good at my job technically, but because when I present, I freeze, they start to think that I'm not as good as I really am. So right. that's what it keeps costing you. Right. Yes, absolutely. How much is it costing you? That's the best answer ever. Thank you for that. Well, we mentioned a little bit prior to this VUCA. 
I, you've mentioned that you've heard of it. And what are your thoughts, just briefly, because VUCA can get very um, involved and I'm, I'm involved with VUCA, but just give us a little insight into what your thoughts are on the VUCA program or the VUCA concept. Right. Here's what I learned and it, it ties in a little bit with my South Korean experience. We cannot, as we said earlier, do things the way we used to and hope to be able to survive or thrive even. You know, you're either going to go extinct like the dinosaurs or, okay, let's not mention the dinosaurs. Some people say, oh, 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 I was born way after the dinosaurs. Think of BlackBerry. We are old enough to remember the BlackBerry phones or Kodak cameras. Now, phones, smartphones have cameras. If you don't keep up with all the technological changes, with all the societal changes, with all that is going on around, in the world around you, and you tailor make your business, whatever offering you have, whatever service you have, whatever product you have, to be able to solve problems going forward, to be able to be a solution, and you just think, oh, we... This is how we've always done it. My father founded this company 50 years ago. I'm, I'm not listening to anybody. We'll see how long that lasts. At the end of the day, VUCA, which means uh, volatile environment we live in. Look what COVID taught us. Look at what we learned in the last three years. Who was ready for a global pandemic with lockdowns? and businesses shutting and everything going back to Zoom. We, we had to learn what Zoom is and working from home. Look at what COVID taught us. So anybody who was not able to quickly adapt and find new ways of working, learning, schools were shut down at one point. How did, they, how did that work out? So, yes. and then you, you have this, it, it's complex. It's complex, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous. You cannot, and I know some of us, I used to have this as well when I was much younger, especially in my 20s, I used to think, I'm a lot happier when I know exactly what's going on. I started transportation planning, I love planning, I love to know what's going on, when, how, and I know how it's gonna come out. <laughs> like all that control gave me some form of false power, I should say, but you cannot, afford to be that way anymore. You cannot control anything. What you can control is how you respond to it, how you keep up with it, so that you adapt and just keep being flexible enough. Be pliable, just keep going. Just, oh, okay. Oh, so they don't use these anymore in the market? Okay, let's tweak our product a little bit. Oh, this is what they have a problem with now. So let's tweak our service a little bit. Always right. keeping up but also not letting these uncertain, complex, ambiguous, volatile environments throw you off. Because unfortunately, some of us, it, it does throw us off our base, our foundation, and we think, oh, I can't do this. So hopefully you don't get to that place. And if you do, find a way to inwardly nourish yourself somehow and have that resilience you spoke about earlier that resilience of, I can keep going, but keeping going, have the resources, look for the resources in order to help you keep going. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not going to be the way it used to be. It's not gonna be like the 80s where things were, you know, <laughs> like a very small title. Now things change at a really fast pace. So please, yes. for your own benefit. Yes, yes. Yes, and they're going to get even faster, which not to, to freak anybody out, but that's the world we live in now. I mean, with technology moving as fast as it is, there's most likely technology that's already created that's more advanced uh, than we could even fathom, but they ho hold it back a lot of the times because it's just almost overwhelming for the human. And in fact, that is one of the things that the VUCA is now concentrating on uh, how to bring the humanness into the age of AI, because it mm. is going to be a huge topic. Um, it is a huge topic, but as one individual told me, um, 
the artificial intelligence is not part of the divine. So therefore it will never be human. It could take on human characteristics. Oh, this is a whole nother topic, but it, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so absolutely we have to learn how to become anti-fragile resilient and to adapt um, because otherwise, like you said, we will, we will get stuck and you have a choice. Do you want to live by the record of the past or step into the wave of the future? And uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you a hundred percent. So how do you think leaders cope with such a fast changing world? I know you've touched on most of that, um, but if let's say you were in a leadership position today, are they, do you, uh, I feel that leaders right now are almost themselves in a, an area that they are reaching out for help because I've seen several articles about having to deal with the new workforce, having to deal with AI, having to deal with, uh, you know, individuals who changed their life for COVID, but now they're asking them to change it back because they want them back in the office. So we've got leaders that are, are, are in a position where, you know, they're, they're, they're actually trying to figure things out for themselves. So is there anything that you can say how a leader could cope in this fast changing world? Mm -hmm. You just reminded me, speaking of going back and forth between the office and home, you just reminded me there's this heartbreaking story. I saw the other day of this lady who was saying, we were debating in my company whether we should go to the office four days a week and then work from home the rest of the week, whatever it is. And she said to them, I don't have the luxury of debating this. I don't have a home. I live in my car. So I need mm -hmm. to go to the office because if, if I'm home, I can't open my computer in my car and do my work. So if you're a leader and someone in your team is in that situation, and then because remember also during COVID, a lot of like restaurants and businesses that couldn't survive, they shut down. So a lot of people lost their jobs, which might have led to them losing their homes. Mm -hmm. And so you have, when you have team members in those situations, you have team members who got accustomed to being home with their children and and really, and, and they thought, I've been working for 15 years. I didn't realize how much I'd missed my kids, but now they must go back to the office and go back to the way they used to work um, before COVID. And then you have team members who want to go to the office and think I, I'm claustrophobic in this apartment walls. Somebody get me out of here. So how do you navigate such a varied wide range of desires on whether to go back to the office or not? They're going to have to find some common ground, whether half the week is, I mean, it's five days, but three days at home, two days in the office, take turns. I've heard some companies that if last week Jane was in the office, this week I'll be in the office and we take turns mm -hmm. and you'll be home, right. things like that. They can work out those um, arrangements. But one thing, like you said, one thing is leaders have come to realize before they used to think they are expected to know everything and have solutions mm -hmm. for everything. And now they realize, take that pressure off. We don't want you to know everything. We don't want you to have a solution for everything. Get your team engaged, get ideas from them as well. Get yeah. to know what you think, what they think about each situation and, and see. Brainstorm, everybody say what you think and then we can come together and see what's the happy medium so that we can find the best solution for all of us. But it's good that they realize you don't have to have the answers because that's a lot of pressure. Imagine in this VUCA world that's so volatile and changing and you think you must always come up with the answers. That's a lot of pressure. It will yeah. drive anybody crazy. It will drive anybody crazy. So just get your team involved and always keep up with what's going on. I cannot emphasize that enough. I had a guest the other day on the show who said, 
if you're at university right now, because I asked him, I said, what if somebody's studying something and wondering, huh, if I graduate in four years, do you think this thing will still have a job that I'm studying? <laughs> you know, it's true. If you, he said, if you're at university, right now, yes, it's so real. You could be studying beyond student loans and the next thing, your job is taken fully by AI. So he said, dedicate two hours a day just learning some AI skills and then put them as part of your resume. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Because that is, that is a realm that's already in the businesses. But going back to what you were saying about leadership, flexibility is key in today's world. And like you said, collaboration, bringing in your team to help each other come up with solutions, not being the hierarchy where you are the individuals that expect to come up with the solution. Because we just worked with the corporation and the light bulb went on for the leader when we were working with them. And he said, oh my gosh, this is my team. The, the individuals who were taking the course were you know, with us throughout the whole VUCA training. And at the end of the last day, he looked around the table. These were all leaders within the corporation. And he said, you guys are my team. You're my new team. We're going to get together and we're going to collaborate and figure this thing out together. And he had never thought of that before. He thought, well, I'm the leader. They're looking to me for solutions. I have to come up with them because you know, that's my job. And all of a sudden, because they were giving him ideas, he was all excited. He said, this is what we need to do. We need to come together and hash it out with each other. So it's exactly what you said. So what I, what I felt was flexibility and collaboration. And there's another thing called um, purposeful presence, which is about giving individuals the purpose, why they're there why they're there in the office, purposeful presence. What does that mean? So it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's an incredible amount of, uh, of synergy with the VUCA training and the leadership and what is required in today's world. So thank you for that insight. It just turned on all my light bulbs. So it was great. Thank I you. love that. My love pleasure, it. Jane. And speaking of, yes, and speaking of purposeful presence, I don't know if you've read some of the articles where they say, oh, the CEO wants all his stuff back in the office. And mm. I know that sometimes there's this fear of if Jane is home, do you think she's working or just napping all day and just working for two hours and I'm paying her for the whole day. <laughs> because I know they have that fear sometimes and that's why purposeful presence, they want to physically see you sitting on a cubicle for eight hours and think, ha, huh, she's earned her paycheck. You know, so that's, that's a but trap you, you could be daydreaming in your cubicle. I mean, it, that, that, that's the whole thing. They don't know that you, individuals will know eventually if you're doing your job it would only take a week or two for others to realize well i yeah i don't know what she's doing so it you know i mean unless you're on an assembly line where you, you know you have putting widgets and so on and so forth which doesn't happen much anymore because that's all automated um you know they're gonna realize that there's nothing coming from your end of the you know the spectrum they they'll, they'll see that you're not holding up your own it doesn't matter what type of job you're in they're just going to realize it and so will your co-workers because who's got to pick mm -hmm. up the slack right so it all comes together mm -hmm. but there's no question that it's integrity you know if if you if you do your job and you do it well and people realize you're not napping all day and and let's face it some jobs today don't have to be done during working hours they can be done. So you're not working nine to five. Okay. But as long as you get it done, that's the point, right? I mean, there are the some. Outcome. That you have to do. Yes. Thank you. Mm. That's the word. The outcome. It's all mm. about the outcome. Thank you. Oh, we'd make a great team. <laughs> so, I love it. I love, I love it. it. Thank you. Yes. So tell us who your ideal podcast listener is for your podcast. Mm -hmm. Usually it's, I'm good at my job 
and they need me to make a presentation. You, you know, sometimes that you're, oh yeah, you know what? I found this potential ideal client. I would like you robot to go and present to them, show them our products, what we can do for them, the solutions that we have for the problems I think they have. Take the company profile, go and make this presentation and you freeze. So usually it's, I started with engineers because that's the field I'm from, but it's usually professionals who say, I'm really good at my job, but I don't know how to make a presentation and it could jeopardize my job if I don't work on this skill. So public speaking skills, presentation skills, that's usually the professionals who listen to us in order to be able to improve those skills and accelerate their careers, be promoted to leadership positions because those skills are necessary. Because if you don't know how to present, how will they make you the leader of a team so that you sit in a boardroom with other directors and, or the board and show them what's going on with your division. So you need those mainly are the audiences that listen to us. Yes, absolutely. And it, it flows into entrepreneurs as well, because as an entrepreneur, you definitely have to understand how to communicate or, you know, in some way, whether it's, it's, it's on your website, whether it's doing what we're doing now, or whether it's communicating to raise money, um, you know, or, or you're in retail and you need to, you know, be communicating with your customer to, uh, to sell certain products. It, it's really, yeah, it really does boil down to not just the corporate, which is big, but also the entrepreneur. Uh, and that's, that's a, a huge market for women right now. So I think that's so exciting because there are so many women that are stepping out and becoming their own bosses. So it's very exciting. I love it. <laughs> and when you said earlier that, that women, it's because we haven't been accustomed to being in some spaces. And so we think, oh, I'm just lucky that they're accommodating me in this group of C-suite executives because I'm the, that's why we don't speak up. We already think we, oh, they, I'm, I'm just thankful that I'm here. Instead mm. of, I do, I'm, on merit, I do belong here. We, we don't come right. with that energy of, I do belong, I do deserve to be here, yes. So that's why right. we don't speak I love it. Sometimes. It's attitude. Attitude. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Roberta, it's been delightful. If there were one critical message that you could share with the world, what would it be? There's only one of you. Be authentically you. And when you learn to communicate who you truly are, that's how you will connect, whether professionally or personally. Mm. That's beautiful. Absolutely perfect. I love it. So because we're here on the Epic Vision Zone, I have one last question. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? Epic story. I did it my way, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I love it. That sounds and here's perfect. why. <laughs> I did it my way. My surname Nzela is a Zulu word, meaning all our names and surname in Zulu in surnames in Zulu they have meaning. Is a mm -hmm. Zulu word meaning the way or the path to somewhere. Mm. So, so that makes so perfect usually, sense. I did it my way. I did it my surname. <laughs> yes, I did it my way. I think that would be the title. I love it. That is absolutely perfect. Well, thank you so much, Roberta, again, for joining us here today. Once again, for information and to connect with Roberta, go to the Epic Vision Zone bio pages where you will find all of her social media and direct contact information. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Jane Applegath. And don't forget to connect with me at janeapplegath.com where you can get access to your free downloads, creative power and vision play sheet. I'm sending you so much love and greatness. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success.